All right, welcome in college football week three. It is upon us after a pretty good one last night uh, to start off. We got a couple of pretty good games tonight to uh, to continue along week three. And then, of course, we've got five games coming up uh, this weekend that we are going to focus on on this show. Plus, we'll get to any questions about individual games that you guys may have. It is the college football kickoff show on wagertalk.com as we welcome in what is affectionately known as get it on a shirt people it is the damn friday a team they are here hannibal in the house steve merrill ready to roll brian leonard uh in the house and mr t himself teddy covers ready to roll here on this friday and gentlemen let's jump into a little strange having rivalry week uh week three of college football but all of these games are non-conference now, so good luck with trying to figure all of that out. In the meantime, we will start, Steve, with the Apple Cup. Washington State taking on Washington. Very interesting game, to say the least, here as Washington State coming off a big win as a uh, as a home dog against Texas Tech. Uh, University of Washington, former Mississippi State quarterback now, expecting big things this year. What gives in this one, which I believe is on a neutral field in Seattle? Yeah, it's very strange seeing these games, you know, early in September now. And I, I talked about this in some shows I did nationally last yesterday. We were talking about some of these weird rival games in week three. And I was actually uh, listening to the William Mary coach speak this week. And Richmond is leaving the Colonial going to the Patriot here at FCS. And Richmond William Mary has played for over 100 years. It's like, I think, the fourth longest rivalry in all of college football in Division One. And uh, he said that he does not want to play that game at the end of the season anymore. He wants to play conference games. So that's exactly what you're seeing happening now with this uh, broken up Pac-12 conference with Oregon State, Oregon, uh, Washington, Washington State. And, of course, we've seen it before. We get Utah, Utah State, Colorado, Colorado State. We're going to talk about that game later here in the show. So it's not like this is out of the ordinary. But it does take some of the allure and some of the luster away. And one thing in November, those season finales, we always talk about rival underdogs and I still think there's a little something to it in this game, but I do think it it maybe is a little less impactful when it's week three as opposed to late November when the better team often overlooks that rival team. And keep another reason the rival dogs work in late November is because uh, those teams sometimes aren't going to a bowl game, and that is their bowl game. That's not the case, obviously, when both teams are 2-0 and in week three like we have for this game. Uh, Huskies have some big games on deck, especially a rematch against Michigan coming up soon, and I'm sure they're licking the chops for that one. I run a 10,000 game simulation through my database each week for every game on the board. On on average in this one, I uh, had Washington Huskies winning by about seven points on average in this one. So uh, actually eight, 7.9. So an eight point average win for Washington. So you can make an argument that this line is looking a little bit short currently at the price. Uh, we're seeing around five here on the neutral field. Um, I do think Washington is still the better team. A lot of change for that franchise or that franchise, that school this year. Um, but in a competitively priced game, I'd rather have the better team. And I think uh, that is the Washington Huskies. And I think the fact that Washington State comes into this game uh, 2-0 and will keep them the Huskies focused as well on this neutral field. Uh, looking at those first two games, uh, one thing Washington State did extremely well was run the football, including that Texas Tech upset win, 301 rushing yards on the ground. Um, Washington, a little lackluster against Weber State, allowed 155, but they held Eastern Michigan last week to just 75 yards. And Eastern Michigan's actually an improved team this year. Uh, so I think that was a decent win. I'd rather have the Huskies here at minus five. I make the line eight. I think there's some value with the favorite. Yeah, uh, favorite could very well uh, be the team to beat in the state of Washington uh, this year for sure. But Washington State uh, been a pretty good underdog so far uh, this season. Big rivalry game coming up there. And then, of course, Brian Leonard in the house. Uh, pretty... <laughs> The old backyard brawl, uh, which I think is going on for 130 some odd years. Anytime you get West Virginia and Pitt together, uh, this should be a good one too. Pitt is a home dog in this matchup here. How do you see this one rolling? Yeah, uh, very much famous uh, history mm -hmm. between these two. A uh, big knock conference rivalry game here is uh, last year, the Mountaineers won 17-6 to as they took advantage of a very questionable Panthers offense. Uh, this is also the first road game for West Virginia after splitting with Penn State and Albany, New York at home. Really like this uh, offensive unit for the Mountaineers, but 
Still have some concerns about the defense. Uh, too many quality defenders have left the program, while not enough high-quality talent has returned. And I will start off with Pitt here. You know, they interplay with a nice 2-0 and mark. But uh, don't get fooled as they struggled against Kent State and Cincinnati. Golden Flashes are considered one of the worst teams in college football, yet they scored 24 points against this stop unit. And to tell you what uh, the Lions makers think of Kent State, they're a 49 or 50-point underdog this week against Tennessee. So uh, that win over um, Kent State, throw it out, didn't mean anything. And then last week they had the big comfort behind against Cincinnati and get that victory. So they come in 2-0, and but this will be the toughest team they played thus far. Um, the Pan- you know, you go back and look at the Panthers. They won just three games a year ago. Uh, they beat Walford, Louisville, and Boston College. They just haven't recruited as well lately and have lost a great deal defensively from a season ago. So it may be a while to this Pitt team is back to where they were before. Um, you know, we, we look for the West Virginia offense to have a sizable advantage in this one. And they just need to win the game to cover, as you pointed out. It's, I, I think they're a one-point favorite here, so... The winner gets the cover. Would be surprised if there's much more combined scoring this year uh, because I like both teams' offense better than the defense. But the Mountaineers have the better all-around talent. Don't like the defense, but this offense is by far the best unit on the field in this game. Give us West Virginia as this pit team just hasn't been what they've been in the past, and they still got some more time before they become a quality program once again. Going to take a little bit of time here, but, uh, you know, Narduzzi certainly, uh, boy, do I hate Neil Brown, just on so many different levels. I can't even begin to tell you, but uh, should be a good one with the backyard brawl. Another great one, Teddy covers the old Civil War. You are maybe more years going back between these two. Uh, It's absolutely crazy when you think about it. Uh, on where these programs are. It's a non-conference game now. It's in week three. I guess we should be getting used to that reality in college football, too. These these big rivalries are all non-conference games. They're not going to happen in November anymore. Sure. And, of course, they're not calling it the Civil War anymore because <laughs> people are nervous <laughs> about using that term here in the 21st <laughs> century. So it's simply the Oregon-Oregon State rivalry or former rivalry uh, for uh, this Saturday uh, in Corvallis. Looking at the Wager Talk live odd screen right now, I'm seeing Oregon mostly 16 and a half, total in the 49 slash 50 range uh, as we speak. And my first gut reaction was, oh my God, this is way too many points. You know, Oregon hasn't covered it, or, or it hasn't sniffed a point spread cover so far this year. My clients and I cashed with Oregon State last week in their shutout win at San Diego State. And that one uh, was fairly easy in that ball game. Of course, you know, the defense was able to dominate. But when I started looking at the game a little bit more closely, my enthusiasm for the Beavers, it declined pretty significantly. Uh, all right. Now, first, last week was San Diego State bad, much more than Oregon State good. That was a 7 nothing game uh, into the fourth quarter. Uh, the Beavers were able to take advantage of Aztecs' mistake, and and then San Diego State. When you're transitioning from a run-based offense to a you know a, a spread-based offense, that tends to be a difficult transition first year. Easy, easy winner. Nonetheless, Oregon State, even off the shutout, this is a team that really didn't return anything from last year. When I say nothing, I mean nothing. They had five starters back, one on the offensive side of the football. The head coach uh, left town. Uh, he brought many players with him, and it's a complete rebuilding job for first-year, first-time head coach Trent Bray. I'm not convinced that the Beavers' defense is going to be able to do anything like what we saw last week because Oregon has a legitimate speed edge. And when we look at this series, all right, we look at the series, and it's been a fairly competitive series. Look, Oregon dominated for the better part uh, of the, you know, 2016, 2017, 2018, and 55 to 15, and 69 to 10. And Jonathan Smith came in all of a sudden as a competitive series. You know, three straight years decided by single digits. Oregon State won twice. Last year, Oregon, having recruited defensive speed in a way they hadn't in recent seasons, all of a sudden it's a blowout again. 31 to 7. They covered minus 14. That was at home. But the key in my mind is that the Beavers' offense didn't work in that game. I'm not sure it works in this game either. It's Oregon or pass for this better. And I do lean towards the under as well. 
Interesting, uh, interesting spot here. Again, it's a new era in college football, one in which uh, we all ought to be getting used to here uh, real quick. I do want to, there's two big games, of course, we're going to break down for you roundtable discussion-wise coming up here. One of them is going to be Georgia and Kentucky. The other, of course, everyone's favorite uh, coach to wait uh, and just fall flat on his face. That would be Deion Sanders as Colorado and Colorado State uh, are going to get ready to do battle here this week. We'll go over those in just a second here. Uh, Double R1L, Steve Merrill. Couple of games here tonight on the card uh, that folks are going to be looking at that might be joining us now. Uh, I don't know if you have anything available up on your page at wagertalk.com, but uh, tell us what you do have and uh, do either of these games interest you here tonight? So no client best bets in college football tonight. I do have two advanced Saturday best bets posted nice and early for some early kickoffs and also more to come. But I do have a free play in that UNLV, I'm sorry, not the UNLV-Kansas game, the Arizona-Kansas State game. The other Kansas team, Kansas State-Arizona, made my top 25 video. You know, this week three is always probably the quietest week of the season. There are only two true top 25 matchups. But I do think there's about five and a half points of line value with one of these teams. I gave you my uh, game simulation in the video along with three games for Saturday. So check out that college football top 25 video right after this show here on Wager Talk TV for a free pick in that Arizona-Kansas State game. Should be uh, should be an interesting one. Well, certainly was an interesting one, Brian, last night uh, with Arizona State and Texas State. I'm, I am so glad that Arizona State was uh, a favorite uh, two weeks ago, only to go off as an absolute dog last night and then end up winning as a dog, which is uh, welcome to college uh, football along those lines. Any uh, games uh, tonight that you have available over at your page of Wager Talk, and which one do you gravitate towards tonight, if any? Well, I did pass for clients today in college football in these two small games. Uh, I prefer the UNLV game. In fact, we talked about three games last week, one of them being Kansas. Uh, my opinions won two of the three, and we faded Kansas. And that worked out very well. Uh, but still, don't know if I can get there with the UNLV. The lines went up. It was seven for most of the week. It's going up to nine and a half now. Uh, Kansas is the better talent. Kansas is at home, and they're very good at home, and they're actually a great coach team. But UNLV has done nothing wrong thus far. So if this thing gets to 10, I may become interested. Uh, maybe put a small play on UNLV. But right now, Kansas is the better team playing at home. Uh, but don't count out UNLV. If they go the first half of this game and they're in this game, I could put a lot of pressure on Kansas right now. So maybe it's a better play for me if I'm looking at this live betting and see how it works out earlier. If UNLV shows that they're just as good as Kansas is in that first half, I think they're there for the entire four quarters. Yeah, I, you know, it's something to be said, uh, Teddy. I don't know if you got a, a best bet available for clients in one of these games here tonight, but uh, Kansas with the new OC, not exactly the same Kansas we saw a year or so ago. So it does look like uh, they have taken a little bit of a step back offensively here, but big game against UNLV here tonight. Uh, if UNLV can only play uh, Utah Tech every week, they'd be in the national championship game. Uh, what do you think of these games, and what do you got up in your page of wager talk? So I'm involved with the UNLV game against Kansas tonight uh, on my homepage at wagertalk.com. You can get that play right now. But don't buy any plays, really. Uh, I mean, <laughs> there's a, this 199 deal for yep. NFL and college every play every day for the next 30 days. That's a good package. The weekend package is the way to go. We won last Saturday. We won last Sunday. We hit 71% in college football on Saturday so far uh, this season. Um, so we're involved tonight. We're involved tomorrow. We're involved on Sunday. If you want to get on board, I encourage you, get a package, not a play, although you can get the individual play for UNLV Kansas on my page, wt.buzz backslash tc. Anybody wish they were on a plane next to Kelly Stewart uh, with the Kansas State getting blown out at any point here tonight? Anybody? Absolutely not. I wouldn't want to be anywhere near that aisle whatsoever as she's watching that game flying out to New York. That should be an awful lot of fun as Kansas State and Arizona getting ready. The other Kansas team getting ready to go here tonight. I would not sweat out an under in that one if I was you guys. The uh, Georgia-Kentucky game. We'll start there, guys. We'll go around the horn. 
Uh, Kentucky is an interesting team. I thought they would be a pretty damn good defensive team as usual this year. And then, well, <laughs> uh, South Carolina kicked the snot out of them last week, and so much for that. Uh, but Georgia, uh, they're continuing to roll. This has been an interesting rivalry over the years, uh, Merrill, recently as well. But uh, what do we think? This is a big number for Kentucky to be getting at home, is it not? Yeah, it's always uh, interesting to see how lines move early in the season based on kind of a week one, week two results. We're going to see that in the NFL as well this Sunday. And I always caution betters, you know, don't overreact or underreact, I guess, to week one, week two results. We're going to see more change within the first couple of weeks anytime in football, especially at college football where these guys are 19, 20-year-old kids that haven't even had a preseason. I bring that up because if you click on the openers tab, you know, the Wager Talk free live odd screen is a great resource for free. And if you, there's an openers tab, you can click on If you look at this one, you see everyone opened around 23 and a half, even some 24s. But then you see DraftKings opened at 18. And it stands out as kind of a, an oddball number. The reason is because they post a line before the games kick off the previous week. So last Wednesday, before the teams played on Saturday, the look ahead line was projected to be 18 on this game. After Kentucky looked god awful against South Carolina at home, losing outright as a home favorite, only scoring six points, barely moving the ball putting two different quarterbacks in most of the books open 23 to 24 range it's now starting to come back down though a little bit as i do think that was an overreaction in fact my database simulation 10,000 game simulation has georgia winning by over 21 points on average um and now it's down to 22 so we're seeing to come back to probably where it should be right in between the original look ahead and the true openers i'm going to focus more on the total though in this game i think the under 45 is probably the best option uh open 46 and a half down to 45 and I believe uh, DraftKings, uh, the week before the games were kicked off, was also about 46 and a half. So we haven't lost quite as much value on the total. And Kentucky was honestly bad. They had the Georgia transfer at quarterback. The backup mm. quarterback came in as the new quarterback. Georgia let him go for a reason, and we saw why. He was pulled in the game last week against South Carolina. The Rutgers transfer came in, didn't look much better. Um, I did an early week video, a solo video here on Wager Talk TV. It was unsure who was going to be the start at the time. I haven't dug in. It's not a game that's going to make my best bet card. But I do think um, South uh, Kentucky is going to have trouble moving the ball against maybe the best defense in the country. Keep in mind, South Carolina last year gave up over 400 yards a game, and they were in the 90s in national ranking, and they held Kentucky in check on the road. I think Georgia does the same. Under 45 is worth a look. Uh, when I did the video earlier this week, there were no team totals. I still don't see anything on the live odd screen, but you can do a projection of probably about 10 and a half. Um, at 10 and a half or more, a very key number. I think the Kentucky team total probably worth a look under as well. Yeah, I don't hate that. In fact, uh, over on Instagram, uh, we've got Jay Douglas 2035 says, and I'm quoting, I'm a Kentucky fan, and I can tell you right now, Georgia covers. So even as a Kentucky fan, they are not thinking things are going to go swimmingly here for uh, the, uh, the old Wildcats here as they get ready to take on uh, Georgia, and I, I guess I can't blame them, Brian. I mean, when you're dealing with uh, this Georgia team on any level and you don't have a great quarterback, uh, my goodness, uh, this could spell disaster and rather quickly in this game, no? Yeah, this, this game is uh, a really tough game for myself because I've taught myself over the years to treat uh, sports betting like you would the stock market. And right now, Georgia comes into the season. They were the clear number one. I believe they were rated maybe three points better than Ohio State. Clear number one team in the country. Um, and they're taking on a Kentucky team here that they beat 51-13 to 13 last year. Georgia has a bye coming up. And after the bye, they face Alabama. Alabama, the team that beat them last year <laughs> in the conference championship game, basically cost Georgia the national title. Uh, they're still the best team in college football, even after they they were knocked out. To me, they're clearly the best team last year. They're the best team this year. So what is Georgia's motivation to blow out Kentucky here? That said, you've got a Kentucky team, as Steve pointed out, that was just blown out by South Carolina, a team that we know is not very good. Um, they got real concerns in the passing game in two games this, so far this year. 213 comp combined passing yards and 35 pass attempts, three touchdowns, three interceptions. 
They're not going to be able to run on Georgia, which means they're going to be falling behind and they're going to have to pass. They don't have a passing attack, so there's no way I could bet on Kentucky here, but yet I don't want to back Georgia because it's very easy to overlook this game with a bye next week and then Alabama coming up. So, unfortunately, I think uh, I'll be passing on this game. In fact, I know I'll be passing on this game. I'll be joining Steve on the sideline in this one. But we do have three plays up on tomorrow's card for Saturday, Mm. including a big 5% play in college football. And I haven't had a 5% all season long in NFL or college football. Three plays today, an early game, and a big 5% play. We've got those going tomorrow. Unfortunately, I can't add anything to this one. Teddy, I, I you know, normally with these two teams, I might consider uh, an under, and I certainly would consider an under with Kentucky because, you know, they <laughs> that quarterback is interesting of theirs and uh, didn't exactly uh, get a whole lot going against a much weaker defense in South Carolina last week. Uh, but I'm also fearful, based upon what we saw last week in South Carolina, that Georgia and Beck could light. You know, I don't. Who knows if they're going to stop scoring? They might be able to cover this up themselves. So it's a tough spot. How do you approach this game, at all, if at all? So I'm actually going to uh, parrot some of the stuff that both mm-hmm. Steve and Brian talked about. And one thing that Brian said that I really want to want to expound on a little bit. I don't bet Georgia games. Very, very rarely am I going to bet a Georgia game. Why? Real simple. They're the best team in the country. They're not a team I want to step in front of without a damn good reason. I don't have one here. But when you're looking for value in the sports betting marketplace, you're not going to find it very often with the number one team in the country who's been number one and been in the uh, amongst the elites for the last five years. Mm. So teams like Georgia... The vast majority of games, I'm not betting on them, and they're too good to step in front of. I'm not betting against them. So in general, teams like Georgia, we're going to look to totals more than sides. And when we look at this series history, it's really clear, okay? (laughs) Kentucky scored 13 points where they have 183 total yards last year. They scored Mm -hmm. six points a year before that, 13 the year before that, three the year before that, nothing the year before that, 17 the year before that. The most yards they got in any of those games was 310. They haven't hit 350 yards against uh, Georgia since a 63-31 shootout back in 2014. Mm. Okay, so Kentucky has consistently, year in, year out, been dominated by Georgia's defense. I don't see this year being any different. So Kentucky team total under certainly makes sense. Mm. Full game under certainly makes sense. And that's the only way it could look if I was going to get involved in Georgia, Kentucky this week. Yeah, it, it feels like definitely a team total uh, kind of game there as it's hovering right around. Still 45 is a game total uh, interesting spot there for both these teams. We do have, of course, uh, a final game here, and then we'll take some questions. Those of you guys joining us in the chat rooms, if you have a particular game uh, you are interested in, uh, have a question, drop it in the chat rooms, and we'll get to uh, as many as we can here, but we are going to look at, and then Merrill, let me ask you a question to start here. Uh, and I'll ask all three of you guys, though. Uh, how Can you remember, and I'm not saying this is uh, true or not, but certainly uh, when you open up X and social media, can you remember a more overhyped college coach in the history of the game that is going to fall flat I, any which way you cut it Merrill the expectations for Dion are over to, and a lot of that is just him uh it, it, and the media propping him up his son up and they're uh, listen I think the son could be a great NFL quarterback but not with the Colorado people he's got around they still have no offensive line this just feels like it's a dumpster fire waiting to happen here but I can't remember a more hyped guy that never lived up to the expectations in college football as a coach. Can you? I, I, I'm a big Dion guy. and He was with the Redskins back in the day. I, yeah. I still choose 21 quite often for jerseys, believe it or not. So I, I've always been a big Dion fan. He was but an incredible player, athlete to watch. I, I know, I know. But so <laughs> what? my point, though, Joe, is I'm a little biased. You're asking right. a very biased person who likes Dion. Um, so I don't quite look at it like that. Plus, I'm an FCS guy, as you know, mm. and I think what he did at Jackson State was pretty impressive. Now, granted, he had some 
Heisman Trophy caliber guys at the FCS level that came with them over to Colorado. Um, but we all knew that this team was vastly overhyped. And, you know, Teddy talks about it's hard to fade Georgia. I'm with them. I very rarely use Georgia games for the same reason. Um, I think last year, actually, Kentucky was a very public dog, if I recall. I remember mm. talking about that in my top 25 video. So that's one of the few times I did step in with Georgia was last year in that Kentucky game. Um, Brian Leonard and I have talked about this on shows the past few weeks. You know, we were licking our chops to fade Colorado. And I remember stepping in with Washington last year. What was that 42-6? to six. Um, So, yes, they're an overrated team. And the line is still too high. In fact, um, my projection, my simulation has a five-point win for Colorado. Unfortunately, the line's a little lower after the Nebraska blowout. DraftKings look-ahead line last Wednesday before the game was 10. Most other books opened seven and a half to eight range after the Nebraska beat down 28 to 10. Um, I like Nebraska in that game. I mentioned it on some shows here. I favored them by 12 and a half. I thought that five was way too low. We actually talked about it last Friday right here on this show. Um, the thing about Colorado that jumps out to me once again this season is they cannot run the ball. Not that they even try to, but 45 rush attempts on the two games combined, and they've gained 59 and 16 yards in each game on the ground net. Now, obviously, they pass a lot. Sacks are taken out of that. But still, this is a team that has over 680 passing yards, and they've rushed for a total of 75 net rushing yards in two games. Um, if this was the 1990s, Colorado State would be jumping off the board to us as a live home dog that just ran for 246 yards last week against Northern Colorado. Um, problem is, I did fade Colorado State in week one solo free video here. I gave everybody Texas minus the 35. They won 52 nothing. So I'm not a big believer in Colorado State, um, but I do still think uh, Colorado's overhyped, as you said. And the line value with my ratings does show some value with Colorado State. And we're getting the better running game as a home dog and technically a rival home dog as well. I saw I saw this thing over the side, I think nine and a half at, at some spots. And it was, I mean, my goodness. And he brings up a good point, Brian, because if you take out the Shador Sanders scrambles, uh, we're looking at a team that's only rushed 30 times for 84 yards. Both Nebraska, I, I mean, the first two games, they all dared them to run the ball and they dropped everyone in coverage. And they won't run the ball. So I I don't know what to make of this outside of uh, Dion is going to make it all about Shador and that's it. I mean, how do you see this thing ultimately ending up when it's all said and done? Well, like I said, we, we t discussed three games last week and I went two and one. And my one loss was a slight opinion on Colorado plus the seven. I didn't trust uh, Nebraska. They just mm. hadn't done it for me yet. Well, now that I saw them, now I can trust Nebraska a little bit more, and I could uh, distrust this Colorado <laughs> team just as much. You know, the Buffalo stepped down to class this weekend if they're taking on an excellent FCS entrant in North Dakota State, and then that much improved Nebraska squad from last week. But, you know, Colorado hasn't beaten an FBS opponent since knocking off Arizona State 27-24 to in Game 6 a year ago. In fact, they've lost seven straight games to FBS opponents. Uh, we've talked about the running game. They're only averaging 1.67 yards per carry thus far, and that's mostly the fault of a really weak offensive line. Uh, the Buffaloes are also weak in the secondary. Take a look at the passing from the opposition so far this year against Colorado. 43 of 56. 43 of 56, and one of those teams was an F FCS entrant, although one of the best, if not the best, in the country. You know, the Rams had revenge for a 43 to 35 loss a season ago. They started the year losing to Texas 52 to nothing. And while still, anytime you lose 52 to nothing, that's not good. After seeing what Texas did to Michigan in Michigan last week, you have to think this Texas team is pretty good. <laughs> so uh, I think we can uh, f take some of the fault away from the Rams in that one. Uh, this is a club that should find success in the running game, which will open up passing opportunities. I talked about how bad the passing defense is for Colorado. Uh, Colorado, I still think, is the better team. And the Lions telling you they're the better team here. But I don't want to bet on Colorado, especially as a road favorite here. Too many players, too many new players on this Colorado team. They really have gone back and forth in the, in the portal. And so they don't have many returning players. Uh, that's not a good thing sometimes, especially early in the season. 
They're still trying to work everything through. They've looked terrible so far. No way I'm laying the seven. Uh, this is probably out of three games we talked about. This is my best bet out of the three. They'll be playing the Rams out of a conference that nobody seems to want right now. And uh, we'll fade Colorado. Uh, yeah, fade it, it is. I mean, uh, Teddy Schnellenberger, he's not. Uh, he's not going to be rolling into uh, Colorado and revamping uh, like he did with uh, Miami and FAU. And I was, no, 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 not going to happen. But to Brian's point, uh, you can, you always like to judge a new coach with how much attrition does he have? How many guys are coming back that want to play for him? And I mean, 55 new scholarship players he brought in. Everybody left that played for him a year ago. And here we are, refusing to adjust in the first couple of games to what the defenses are giving them. Does it change, Teddy? Can you remember a more overhyped coach in all of college sports? Never. I mean, it's really not – again, I've been in this my 27th mm. football season in Las Vegas, and Dion last year to this year this has gotten more hype than any of them. Mm. And we knew last year that the team was overhyped. We made money betting on them early because all the wise guys wanted to fade them, and then the rest of the year – uh, after they got off to that hot start, they were an easy fade, including last year in this rivalry game, a game that Colorado State led by double digits in the fourth quarter. They let it get away. Colorado ended up winning in double overtime. Now the Rams with overtime revenge in a one-way rivalry. Colorado's not, you know, the, the, the kids that Dion have recruited are not interested in beating Colorado State the way that the Colorado State recruits are interested yeah. in beating Big Brother Colorado. Point. Okay, yep. it's a one-way rivalry in that game, just like, you know, uh, in, in the sense that Western Michigan's a one-way rivalry when they go to Michigan State or uh, that, that type of thing. And Colorado's exactly what we thought they were. They have an elite quarterback, an elite playmaker, and Travis Hunter. They have a dicey defense and a dicey offensive line and a lack of depth. I mean, it's nothing different. And... What really concerns me about Colorado were the comments last week that Shador Sanders made after the game. When you're throwing your offensive line under the bus, and there's no mistake about it, that's what happened in those mm -hmm. quotes. And you have all the, you know, you have a program that's a little bit volatile to begin with. Uh, I'm with you, Bry. It's Colorado State or pass in this ballgame. And Jay Norvell has the arrow pointed in the right direction for the Rams, no question about it. The question I have, the problem I have with Colorado State in this game is, is team speed. I really worry about Colorado State getting just outrun by Colorado. Mm. They're not a fast team. <laughs> and that's what cost in the game last year. So if the Buffs get going, it could get ugly for Colorado State in this ballgame. But to be honest, I don't want. I cannot lay a TD with Dion and company on the road. In fact, if I'm going to play the game, I'll probably sprinkle a little something on the money line with the underdog. Yeah, it's the only way I could look here. A couple of good comments uh, in the section. I know, uh, I believe it was Alejandro uh, wants to know what if we think Travis Hunter uh, is set to have a big game. Listen, as long as he's on the field with Shador, he's going to have a big game, especially against bad defensive teams, right, Teddy? I mean, there's no way around it. Uh, Colorado State says, Chris, just 4-10 and 10 against the number dating back to last year. They have not been uh, great uh, against the number. We know that. And also, Kenny writes in, maybe Jackson State was the perfect, absolutely perfect situation for Dion. right? You've got above average talent there with your son and guys that want to play with him. You're in the, you know, in a, a weaker division. You're going to have more talent. So, it's a different ball game as opposed to thinking you're going to take over Colorado and uh, and think that everyone is just going to want to come uh, to play with your kid. And that is not the situation uh, that we have gotten there in any way, shape, or form. So I uh, can't wait for this thing to be a bigger dumpster fire than it is. How many more, Merrill? How many more reporters do you think he'll ban? What's the over-under? Uh, right? The Colorado Post guy wasn't allowed to come back in, right? The Denver Post, sorry, you can't. Too hard. Too many hard questions. What? How many more do you think uh, get banned before the end of the year here? The over-under, I'll have it one and a half, but I just, <laughs> I'm still blown away by your your dislike of Dion. I would have thought you were a Dion type of guy with the baseball background. I love and the, the Dion tough. as a player, I but know. this Florida was State, never I mean. going to work out, ever. <laughs> this was never going to be a realistic situation. And the problem is, 
I'm listening. I hope they win one game they're not supposed to because then the market will go back to loving them and we'll be able to fade them at a much better price Correct. throughout, right? I mean, that's what we're really hoping for here, Merrill. But I don't know that beating yeah. Colorado State is going to is going to move that needle. Yeah, I'm looking at Mark Lawrence's uh, playbook annual right now because he has the recruiting class ranks, right. which I don't follow very close because it doesn't really help you as a handicapper like in a given year. But I find this interesting. So the two years before Dion, they were 60, well, 36, 64, 47. And then his first mm -hmm. year, 2023, they were the 30th. According to the Mark uh, Lawrence, coming in this year, they had the 81st recruiting class. So they went way down this year. I think Oof. that's fascinating because you would think, to your point, you know, he'd start getting his guys in there. This was their weakest ranked recruiting class in the last five years, even before he was there as the head coach. So that's not boding well. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is they went one and eleven the year before, two and ten against the spread. Last year they went four and eight straight up, but seven and five against the numbers. So that's why we still see these lines inflate it because mm -hmm. they've you know been kind of a break even point spread team for the public. Because I keep asking myself, at what point is you know average Joe going to stop losing money with Colorado? Of course, this team what covered the first uh, two of the first two games last year. And they went one and four ATS the next five. And they actually went four and one ATS their last five, despite losing all five straight up. So we'll see if that plays out again this year, where we actually start getting value with Colorado in the second half of the season. So, uh, Teddy, let me uh, start with you. A couple of questions uh, coming in on uh, on TikTok and Instagram. I'll combine them for you because they both have the same theme. Uh, Notre Dame's offense is hot ass, but so is Oklahoma's. And here we are both laying uh, a number here this week. Uh, Oklahoma at home taking on Tulane. Their offense has been terrible. And so is Notre Dame's. I mean, I don't know why you keep scraping the barrel with ACC bottom tier quarterbacks, but that's what Notre Dame keeps doing here. Whose offense do you think eventually comes around? Do you have faith in Oklahoma or Notre Dame? Because both are struggling to score some points here. Well, eventually, I'll, I'll say both. Mm. Uh, I mean, I don't think that we're talking about long term. I don't think either one of these offenses is in trouble. We've certainly seen a lot of money come against Notre Dame this week in the matchup mm -hmm. at Purdue. The money's poured in against Notre Dame even this morning. And there are concerns about Riley Leonard's health and maybe significant concerns in that regard. That said, uh, I saw a quote from Brian Kelly talking about, hey, Riley Leonard's our guy. He'll be just fine. Uh, uh, I said, uh, Brian uh, Kelly, Marcus Freeman, I should yep. say, uh, the, the current head coach of Notre Dame, not the former head coach of Notre Dame. Uh, but I saw Marcus Freeman quote saying, you know, uh, Riley Leonard's our guy. He's going to be just fine. I wouldn't worry too much. And of course, this is at least something of a defensive step down in class, certainly compared to what they faced, uh, last week. Uh, and, and uh, so I probably say two weeks ago, mm. and then last week against Northern Illinois, a, a clear flat spot where Riley Leonard wasn't 100% or even close to it. Purdue's defense is not elite. All right. Mm. It might be okay. It's certainly not a defense that's going to compare it all to Texas A&M's. Now, if Leonard isn't healthy, it's a different story. But uh, for the, again, based on the quote that I saw from Freeman, I think. Leonard uh, and, and the Purdue uh, the Notre Dame offense will be just fine. Oklahoma's got OL issues right now, and mm. we'll see how long that takes to work out. But it was certainly on display in week one. It was certainly on display in week two, and they're certainly not a team I'm looking to make points with personally in week three. Uh, yeah, Merrill, you are, are you on the same page with uh, Oklahoma and Notre Dame? Doesn't feel like we're going to be getting a lot of overs anytime soon with these two until Teddy's right. The offensive line is decimated there uh, in OU, but I do we trust Riley Leonard? I I, I just uh, I don't know. I don't think he's a great passer. I think he's a better runner. And then what happens if that doesn't come through for them? The defense is going to have to win them a lot of games, no? Well, it's always a red flag for me when a team doesn't even score the point spread, and that's what both teams did. It's one thing mm. not to cover. To not even score the point spread means you never had a chance the entire game to cover. Mm. Um, so these offenses are a concern. But I also I think something else you got to point out about money coming against Notre Dame this week is the letdown factor. Notre Dame's an independent. They only play five ACC games, so they don't qualify for a conference bid. Yeah. So that non-conference loss hurts them more than any other school because they can't win their conference now. Um, I see it very difficult for Notre Dame to make the playoffs, especially since their schedule got weaker now that Florida State has a couple losses. Um, so I think the season's over for Notre Dame. you got to wonder how much the players realize that, and you always worry about that letdown factor. Uh, my projection, my simulation with all that not even included has Notre Dame by 10. 
So I think it's pretty much around that Purdue line. Um, I do favor Oklahoma by 21. Mm. Had a best bet on them in week one against Temple. That was as much a play against Temple than a play on Oklahoma. Stayed off the game last week. Um, but I do think we're getting some line value with Oklahoma this week. So those two teams, I would trust the Sooners more. Yeah, interesting question uh, coming in, uh, Brian, regarding uh, Utah and Cam Rising, who is out again. Shocker. Uh, and I believe Utah State also has a issue. Uh, I was wondering what happened to Spencer Petrus uh, since they ran him out of Iowa. Uh, fantastic uh, that he ends up at Utah State, but he might not be playing either. But I, I can can you picture Utah moving forward in the Big 12 without a, a Cam Rising at some point? I, I just feel like they're they're biting time here. Uh, if he can't come back or won't come back. I, Utah in the Big 12, and I just don't think it's going to work. I mean, they should be able to get past Utah State, though, no? Yeah, they should. And and they've got enough games where they've had to worry about him over the years. It's crazy. Uh, so they should be used to him struggling and, and not uh, being fully healthy. Um, I, I take a look at that entire conference, and I've got questions about a lot of these teams in that Oof. conference. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, regarding the two, game, two teams that you had mentioned earlier, the Irish and, and Oklahoma, I think the key for both those are the line play. Yep. And you can have all the skill position players, and Oklahoma's done that for years, great skill position players, but if you can't protect the quarterback, you can't win. And that's the problem for both those programs right now, is as long as you can protect the quarterback, yep. you can win with a mediocre to an average quarterback in college football, if he's on his back all the time, and we've seen, you know, we, we talked about, you know, Colorado earlier about the lack of the run game. You, you've got to be able to open holes from the run game, and you've got to be able to play well on both sides of the football. And yeah. the Irish against Northern Illinois, um, they were blown away on the offensive and defensive lines. Yep. Uh, the Huskies were the better team. They controlled the line of scrimmage. And that's how you get upsets in college football. When you have a lesser team that can control the line of scrimmage, until some of these teams get their offensive lines and defensive lines, in many cases, worked out well, I'm not laying points with those numbers, but I agree with Steve. Oklahoma, I think, out of the bunch, would be the best one to come back. But still, let's wait another week before uh, we're laying double digits. Yeah, I uh, and, and Utah better get Cam Rising healthy at some particular point here if they're really going to make a, uh, a run here at any sort of upsetting for the Big 12 championship. Don't forget, guys, we did mention to you earlier, uh, how about that NFL and college football combo right now? Take advantage of it. 30 days of all access in both the NFL and college football with your favorite handicapper over at Wager Talk, including Double R1L, Steve Merrill, Hannibal, the A-team here. We've got Mr. Brian Leonard ready to go, as well as the real Mr. T, Teddy Covers. Uh, you guys, I mean, no better way. NFL, college football, 30 days, all access, $199. Visit them over at their pages at wagertalk.com and hop on board. Any questions you have about any other games, guys, make sure you drop them in to the comment section if you're watching us here on the, uh, on the rewatch here because... We're going to be answering them right up through kickoff here tomorrow. So great opportunity to drop those comments below and hear what these guys have to say. And we certainly appreciate uh, the time. And on behalf of Steve Merrill, as well as Teddy Covers and Brian Leonard, guys, much more college football still to come as this is only week three. It's going to get only better from here. Best of luck with the plays here this weekend. Come back and join us again next week for another edition of the College Football Kickoff Show. Good luck.